All right, hopefully uh, everybody can hear me and uh, see me as well as see my screen. We can, thank you. Well, thanks for uh, having me involved with the Corona Initiative and uh, I'm Charles Yates. I'm a faculty at IU. Uh, you can tell from my <coughs> Uh, annoying background, but I didn't think that you guys needed to see my dirty office and figured you'd had enough of uh, that anyway. So uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks for listening. We're going to talk about neurofibromatosis type 2, uh, which is a complex entity that a lot of us in ENT, whether or not you're in neurotology or um, any other discipline, may seem just because one of the chief diagnostic uh, paradigms we have for it is uh, people coming in with hearing loss, especially people who don't have a, a family history of NF2. So uh, all of us should be prepared to uh, deal with the patients. And there's certainly a, a complexity that's nice to have a little bit of understanding whether or not you're a neurotologist or a neurosurgeon or medical geneticist. So. Um, I don't have any uh, disclosures for this talk. Um, basically, we'll go uh, with uh, common presentations for NF2 and some background on NF2 itself. Uh, we'll talk about the treatment modalities of hearing loss and then some of the thera therapeutic options uh, for NF2. Where are we today? So <clears throat> I like our, our context of uh, kind of perceiving where how we might see one of these patients. So. Um, you're seeing a new patient in clinic who's 19-year-old white female. Uh, she's really there just because she has left-sided tinnitus. It's been there persistent for several months. It's non-pulsatile. Uh, maybe a little bit of decreased hearing on the left, less than a year. It's kind of slowly started. There haven't been any infections, no history of ear surgeries, no vertigo, no talgia, no otorrhea, no medical problems. She's in in college and uh, just came back for a checkup over the, the Christmas break. She's got a audiogram here showing a uh, left-sided sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, key things in looking at these audiograms um, is a, a kind of a curious reduction in the amount of uh, speech discrimination associated with it. So you have that candidate symmetry, it's appropriate to get an MRI and then when you get this MRI, you find here that you have a, on a uh, <clears throat> um, contrast, uh, uh, contrasted axial uh, T1 MRI. Uh, you've got this enlarged, in, uh, very, very large, what looks like a vestibular schwannoma on the left side, certainly tightly compressing brainstem here, uh, compressing on your fourth ventricle. If we go up higher, she doesn't have any hydrocephalus because with slow growing tumors, the brainstem can tolerate a surprising amount of uh, compression without obstructive hydrocephalus. But this, with the nature of having bilateral vestibular schwannoma, sets you off that she has uh, NF2. So, <clears throat> what what is NF2? NF2 is a autosomal dominant mutation that occurs on the short arm of the 22nd chromosome. So it's a uh, uh, Merlin is the pro protein product of the NF2 gene. Um, this is essentially Merlin is a tumor suppressor, and we'll get a, a little bit into more of that, but I won't, uh, I won't kill you guys with uh, molecular signaling pathways because uh, presumably people want to be surgeons, and that's not the favorite, uh, favorite thing of surgeons. But when we take out these uh, cells and grow them in culture, um, they, they don't have contact dependent growth arrests. So they continue growing even when they touch each other, which is an abnormal response for a normal cell. Um, of people who have uh, NF2, about half have a positive family history. Uh, other cases, so these founder cases, um, may have bilateral acoustic neuromas or vestibular schwannomas. Uh, but have otherwise unaffected parents. So typical tumors associated with NF2 are schwannomas, meningiomas, ependymomas, and other uh, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system tumors, usually not malignant tumors. Um, 
although there are certainly exceptions to that. Um, if you have a mutation of your NF2 gene, you have a nearly 100% expression of a problem by age 60. Uh, but the hallmark of the disease is bilateral vestibular schwannomas. So how do people uh, present? So um, <clears throat> in, in most studies, people are gonna present in their 20s, 30s with uh, hearing loss. And this is for NF2, not necessarily for vestibular schwannoma. Uh, but people can certainly display uh, tinnitus, dizziness, lack of coordination. Um, and in addition, most patients develop cataracts or ocular lesions. And so here's a, a table kind of showing the, the frequency of uh, um, uh, neurologic tumors associated with NF2. Obviously, you see by far and away most are bilateral vestibular schwannomas. There's certainly a propensity for these schwannomas to occur on the vestibular portion of the eighth cranial nerves, but they occur on other cranial nerves. <clears throat> meningiomas, other spinal tumors, uh, et cetera. So the, um, this average age of diagnosis is NF2, but there's certainly a delay in diagnosis uh, from initial symptoms, usually of about seven years. And this is, again, and it tends to be in, not in family members uh, who already have a known risk of NF2. There's not a difference in the proportion of men versus women who develop NF2, and there hasn't been a prevalence described based on, based on ethnicity, uh, but it's fairly uncommon disease process. The epidemiologic studies would tell us that the incidence is about one in 33,000 live births um, uh, between one to 30,000 and one to 87,000. So <clears throat> no, uh, no presentation on NF2 would be uh, complete without a uh, picture of the Manchester criteria um, because of the uh, um, the UK national health system, people who had a, have NF2 are concentrated at uh, several centers, one of them being Manchester. And uh, because of their um, big populations of people with NF2, uh, they've been a leader in kind of the very, very fascinating genetics of this disease process. But the clinical criteria for diagnosis are the Manchester criteria, uh, criteria and you see the uh, A is certainly bilateral vestibular schwannomas, but if you have a relative with NF2 and a single vestibular schwannoma or any other two of the following, and you see other states, and that's why, you know, we, we talked about uh, NF2 being defined by having bilateral uh, vestibular schwannomas, but there are a few exceptions. There are about 5% people. Uh, who don't based on that <clears throat> chart. So the tumor biology, uh, they do arise from the vestibular sem segment of the uh, eighth cranial nerves from the Schwann cells. Um, the exact location of uh, um, the uh, of, of where they originate is uh, debated, um, and there's no conclusive data. Um, although people may uh, certainly say, oh, it, it comes from inferior vestibular nerve or superior vestibular nerve or the division between oligodendrocytes and Schwann cell transition zone. But, you know, I think there's a lot of debate on those. Uh, they do rarely occur on the cochlear, the auditory portion of the eighth nerve. Um, but when they do, they uh, have a propensity to invade the cochlea. This is a... Uh, uh, photomicrograph showing the typical features of schwannoma. The black area here is showing uh, palisading uh, and the typical uh, Antony A type of uh, <coughs> uh, pattern that you see. This blue area is showing the kind of uh, looser, uh, you know, almost uh, uh, cystic uh, um, Antony B uh, type of uh, uh, histology that you see with the tumor in this, you know, these uh, um, are going to be S100 positive and usually pretty, very specific in uh, <clears throat> being able to be diagnosed by uh, seeing them and adding in some uh, key uh, IHC stains. The um, molecular biology of NF2 uh, shown here is uh, 
Merlin, it comes in a, a number of different isoforms. This is just showing the, the main isoform. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's a, a member of a, a family of cytoskeletal associated proteins. Uh, the Moesin, Ezrin, and Redixin are other um, uh, members of this family that exist in humans. And it's pretty small, 595 amino acids. 17 different exons and mutations that are associated disease were found in all of these exons except for uh, 16 and 17. Now what it what it does is complicated. So this is showing kind of the signaling pathways uh, associated with this and I, this will never well in the next five years uh, this is not going to occur on uh, um, any any boards, so I'm I'm not showing this to belabor, other than to say that there are many different pathways that are associated with cancer that this interacts with, um, many things associated with cell cell signaling, uh, but these are also molecular targets that uh, we work on in our lab to find uh, potential other treatments. Um, but what Merlin seems to do is it brings a lot of these signaling pathway molecules. Uh, together to be able to interact uh, at the actin cytoskeleton by the um, by the membrane by the cell membrane. So let's just move on. So what are we going to do as uh, otolaryngologists when we when we see someone? So <clears throat> NF2 workup, uh, imaging, audiologic testing, maybe consider an ABR. Uh, of course, a comp complete neurotologic exam and then uh, a referral for a neuro ophthalmologic exam because of the uh, high, high number of uh, correlated uh, ocular uh, problems. Um, in any uh, neurotology presentation, I, f I feel like I have to uh, credit uh, Bill House, who's pictured here in the, in the temporal bone, doing, uh, doing work in the temporal bone lab that, uh, you know, we, uh, we, can do uh, in our in our normal lives and learn a lot from that, um, and try to advance our knowledge and understanding of, of temporal bone anatomy and treatment. But that's a soapbox. I'll get off of it. So imaging studies uh, associated uh, are going to be. You need a high quality MRI, and it's um, in particular the you want thin cuts through the internal auditory canal. And you want that with contrast because the uh, tumors themselves are going to be contrast enhancing. You should have a um, dedicated IAC series. Um, if you have those thin cuts with uh, contrast, you can pick up a uh, tumor uh, smaller than five millimeters. So that'd be able you could be able to see the opposite side if you picked up a, um, a unilateral vestibular schwannoma on a brain MRI. Anybody diagnosed with NF2 should also have a complete spine, sphere, uh, spine series performed, evaluating the spine stage of the disease. You know, in, in my institution, my colleagues either in neurology or um, medical genetics who are involved with these patients um, uh, usually order those, but a lot of times to diagnose it by someone, someone for imaging of, of an initial workup, I'll, I'll get that at the same time. So it minimizes time and cost. Uh, screening then, um, if you have a family member of, uh, uh, who has NF2, you know, they're, the children are at risk, um, you can do uh, screening MRIs, usually in kids at around age seven to nine, uh, to reduce uh, a general anesthetic need and maybe even sedation. Kids younger than seven get an audiogram, but certainly any child with symptoms, you go ahead and do an MRI. Um, so in addition to imaging workup, there are many possibilities for genetic testing. I uh, just put up a couple examples here uh, of where, if your institution doesn't have primary genetic testing, where you can send it out to, um, but that, that can be done internationally. Uh, but, but a number of places in uh, the U.S. provide uh, great genetic testing for this. So 
if you're going to do blood testing, I usually get medical geneticists uh, involved with this so that there's genetic counseling for these families. And it also um, uh, tends to help with uh, uh, insurance to, to pay for this. Um, blood testing will identify a defect in 70 to 75% of patients with NF2. Uh, the reason that that is uh, not all of them is that some people have a, 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 a mosaicism um, that uh, you may have uh, an NF2 uh, deficiency in the um, uh, skull base, but not in the, uh, not identifiable in the blood. Um, new mutations tend to be missense. Um, and the, again, there's a, a fascinating and complex correlation of the genetics of, of uh, which exon in, uh, is affected in uh, Merlin, or sorry, an NF2 gene, and which uh, and, and how that correlates to the burden of disease, um, but, but much beyond the scope of this lecture. So the characteristic tumors of NF2, uh, bilateral schwannomas, multiple meningiomas, other cranial nerve tumors, spinal tumors, eye abnormalities, including tumors. So what, some of the uh, eye abnormalities that we're talking about are cortical and posterior subcapsular cataracts, uh, and then retinal hamartomas. So again, I, I'm not uh, uh, using the ophthalmoscope frequently in my clinic, but I'm sending folks to a neuro-ophthalmologist uh, if they have the diagnosis of NF2 for an evaluation. So tumor types that we're, we're dealing with in NF2, so the intracranial schwannomas are uh, uh, unfortunately misspelled here. I know better than that. But they are the most treat frequent non-vestibular uh, tumors. Um, uh, so we see them usually on cranial nerve 5 and cranial nerve 3. For the intracranial schwannomas, they tend to, when they're vestibular, they're obviously bilateral. Lower cranial nerve schwannomas are less involved, but they can be very significant because of their um, location and causing hoarseness and dysphagia. Uh, <clears throat> so meningiomas are seen in nearly all NF2 patients, and they may be multiple. 50% um, uh, have multiple, uh, sorry, but that's an incorrect uh, uh, statement up there. The, the meningiomas, um, Better than 50% uh, may be um, uh, of normal ones, uh, meaning sporadics that uh, occur in the population, which is the most uh, common tumor. 50% of those may have a Merlin deficiency. 90% uh, of uh, uh, people that have spinal tumors at presentation of their NF2. Uh, most commonly, those are meningiomas, but they can also be schwannomas. So here's a uh, uh, sagittal MRI uh, showing, you know, these, this uh, near midline uh, um, meningioma, other meningiomas, and uh, abnormalities of the uh, the dura there. Um, so meningiomas are thought to rise from the cap cells near the arachnoid villi, and they are uh, more prominent near the cranial nerve foramina um, and the venous sinuses themselves. Um, the annual incidence is about 20 to uh, uh, out of 1 million. Um, these are for um, sporadic meningiomas. So it's a very common uh, tumor. It's the most common intracranial tumor. We see asymptomatic meningiomas in 2.3% of individuals, and they t uh, are more prevalent in women at a 3 to 1 ratio, but those odds are evened when you have uh, NF2. The incidence does increase with age. They become symptomatic uh, in uh, sporadic or NF2 um, by several mechanisms. One is if they irritate the underlying uh, uh, cortex of the brain that can cause seizures, uh, compression of the brain parenchyma or compression of the cranial nerves can cause uh, headaches, increased intracranial pressures, even mental status changes, loss of visions, and then the um, cranial neuropathies. Um, if the meningioma is pushing on a uh, uh, artery you can, or vein, you can have vascular compression and get a TIA or stroke. And the symptoms are specific to the location. Now, the 
within the CPA themselves, they are the second most common lesion of the CPA, and you can have both meningiomas and uh, schwannomas in the same cerebellar pontine angle if you have NF2. Um, they're more commonly arising from the posterior surface of the petrous bone, and they can variably extend into the IAC. Again, same symptoms as you would have with the vestibular schwannoma of ataxia from compression on the cerebellum, uh, imbalanced vertigo, hearing loss, tinnitus, facial numbness when it's uh, extending towards the trigeminal. Facial weakness is uh, pretty rare with tumors uh, uh, themselves except for facial uh, schwannomas. The radiographic features as uh, we showed, you know, you generally have a half moon shape with a flat edge uh, along the petrous bone with a uh, dural tail. And from the CPA, they can herniate into the middle fossa. So here's a, a, a nice example of that, that flat uh, feature along the, the petrous face. Um, <clears throat> You know, here, here's one that's shown without contrast, but you can even see it going down into the, uh, um, into the IAC a little bit, but you see that flat, flat feature along the, uh, <clears throat> along the feature space. You see a, a dural tail right here with the contrasted imaging. So they Grossly, at the time of surgery, when you take these out, they tend to be encapsulated masses. They have a well-defined dural base. They can be firm or even fibrous. Um, and if you're lucky, there's a lack of hemorrhage and necrosis. Uh, but they can be vascular as well. Uh, you can see a hyperostatic reaction in the overlying uh, bone. And uh, uh, sometimes these are quite uh, gritty and very difficult to dissect, especially away from uh, uh, a local nerve. So what's the treatment options that we have for these uh, uh, schwannomas and meningiomas uh, that are associated with uh, NF2? So current treatment modalities that we have, uh, one is observation. So if you have one of these, um, uh, you should be keeping an eye on it. Uh, certainly at first diagnosis, uh, six months later, uh, further MRIs with any uh, change of symptoms. Um, you know, we recently had a patient at our institution who uh, had bilateral uh, vestibular schwannomas and was lost to follow up uh, for a number of years and uh, came in wheelchair bound with a, a very large vestibular schwannoma that had uh, in the past looked something like this. Uh, and over the course of a number of years, when he was lost to follow up, he had brainstem compression, and uh, it, you know, it's just a, a, a real, a real challenge because if you do any type of microsurgical resection, you know, outcomes are better in all these microsurgical resections with smaller tumors. We'll always do a little better, uh, you know, when it's a little bit smaller. Uh, radiation treatment is an option. Uh, for NF2, but I, you know, needless to say that it is controversial um, because you are, are radiating uh, people who have a, a, a problem with a, uh, a, a tumor suppressor, uh, and that could cause some down, down the road uh, malignancy problems. And then newly arising on the scene over the past 10 years are some possible medical therapies, but they're really still in development. So, from an otolaryngologist standpoint, a uh, major thing to consider is your is hearing preservation. Um, you know, if with through the course of a lifetime with NF2 with bilateral vestibular schwannomas, there's a um, strong strong chance of having bilateral hearing loss, and and that can go to the profound level. Um, and it doesn't in everybody, but uh, you know the <clears throat> the impact of that in someone who's an auditory oral communicator are are tremendous. Um, so preserving hearing is a, a, a fantastic goal to start out with. So small small tumors less than two centimeters are good candidates for hearing preservation. Um, the thought process if you're doing hearing preservation is you do larger side first. Hopefully that's the worst hearing ear. If you preserve 
hearing on that first side, then you consider doing the second side six months later. Um, hearing results have been reported, uh, especially with smaller tumors and middle plus approach as high as 70% preservation. Now that, it, let me make it clear that I'm not saying that is a, uh, a typical outcome for all comers for hearing preservation. That's kind of the best reported outcome. Uh, but people have shown that it's also, uh, even in those same centers, worse in patients with NF2. So um, unless you have very small, small tumors, you may not want to be especially aggressive about uh, doing a full tumor resection for hearing preservation. So observation, uh, sometimes situations where that may be favored if there's hearing present in only one ear. Uh, if tumors are too large for hearing preservation, um, <clears throat> you know, if you, you may follow every, every month with MRI, every six months, and then annually if this has been stable uh, for a year. Um, certainly do in interventions for brainstem compression, especially in, with a growing tumor um, and brainstem compression, or if there's unserviceable hearing or large size. These are all things that would potentially uh, uh, force you to make a decision regardless of what hearing status is, what other, um, what other intentions you may have. Uh, brainstem compression is something that you uh, um, may have to acutely address. So one option of uh, not taking out tumor is to uh, actually decompress the internal auditory canal, uh, decompress the bony confines of the nerves and tumor within the IAC. So this has been done and most widely reported by the, uh, the House group, uh, has, has the best published series on these. Um, and they've been doing it if there's progression of hearing loss in an observed patient. The surrounding bone of the IC is removed uh, extensively. This can be done from a middle fossa approach. Uh, it can be done from a uh, uh, sub uh, suboccipital or retro sig approach, but removing that bone from the IC removes the pressure of tumor growth. Um, in situations, they've reported that there may be stabilization uh, there is risk of, of hearing loss just by decompressing the IAC, but in uh, their biggest series, 90% uh, of patients preserved their hearing. Uh, generally, that duration of this preservation was just more than, uh, than two years. So <clears throat> from other than uh, surgery and trying to preserve hearing, what, uh, what options uh, are there for uh, management of the hearing loss. So you can do hearing aids. Uh, you know, there's a, a complexity to the hearing loss associated with retrochlear lesions that includes something called rollover. Rollover is when you are um, making sound louder. That uh, can have the effect of uh, uh, decreasing the speech discrimination. So in people with a significant amount of rollover, hearing aids may not uh, be a benefit because making things louder can make things worse. Um, a cochlear implant is a solution uh, even with a tumor in place. Um, you know, with a stable tumor, uh, when you know the cochlear nerve is still intact, if there's been a resection of tumor of loss of hearing and the cochlear nerve is intact, that uh, can be an option as well. The auditory brainstem implant is a, um, we'll get in a little more detail about it. It's been implanted in about 160 patients uh, in the U.S., a lot more worldwide, and 85 to 95% only get, may get a perceived auditory uh, stimulation, but no speech understanding. Um, early detection, no. Oh. Sorry, that's a duplicate slide. So the, uh, Treatment through radiotherapy can be, uh, with, uh, with any form of radiotherapy, it can be cyber knife, it can be um, <clears throat> um, fractionated radiotherapy, but probably the most common form is uh, done worldwide is stereotactic, and the most common form of that is, uh, is gamma knife. This is using a uh, uh, cobalt uh, 
radiation source delivered through uh, converging beams into a, uh, a, a, single, a single area in the middle. This is an older uh, uh, 4C machine. Now with a perfection machine, you don't have to have this uh, uh, cap on the top. Uh, 13 gray is the dose, and five-year tumor control rate is 90%, and facial nerve preservation is greater than 95%. Now, this data is for unilateral vestibular schwannomas. Um, <clears throat> there is a lot less data uh, just by sheer numbers for NF2, but then also a number of the cases, um, when we discuss long-term risks of uh, of stereotactic radiotherapy. One of those risks is uh, um, an, a uh, radiation-induced malignancy or radiation-induced sarcoma. With the initial um, worldwide results of this, uh, a number of people were, uh, had NF2 uh, with radiation, and so this gave people an initial pause. Now, there are centers that have presented uh, significant data showing safety and efficacy of this in NF2. However, it continues to be uh, uh, controversial within the field. So uh, other treatments uh, for, um, especially chemotherapeutic treatments for NF2 started with this article in New England Journal of Medicine, I think it was 2008, uh, written by Scott Plotkin at uh, uh, <coughs> Massachusetts General Hospital. And this is looking at bevacizumab, which is a uh, VEGF, uh, uh, inhibitor uh, and showing that there was hearing improvement um, in patients with NF2 who received this in an off-label um, indication when there was no other alternative for uh, their hearing loss. So this kind of was the first uh, medicine that showed some type of effect. Now, longer-term studies have been done, and this is certainly not the uh, silver bullet that takes care of every factor associated with uh, NF2, um, and it's uh, it, it still can be used to uh, uh, temporize patients. But this kind of started the idea of doing uh, chemotherapeutics with the idea of helping hearing and um, and um, also avoiding surgery. So if we look uh, nationally on clinical trials. Dot com, we can see a number of uh, uh, studies enrolling uh, that are looking at um, different uh, signal transduction pathways uh, at different locations, even worldwide, to uh, <clears throat> try new agents to provide new hope for patients with uh, NF2. So some of these uh, drug therapies can be uh, PI3 kinase AKT inhibitors, RAF, mTOR, FAK, um, RAS signaling pathways, VEGF, and other uh, other pathways. So, they all of them have shown some type of progress and uh, provides a lot of hope for these tumors. And part of the reason for pursuing this is that, you know, <clears throat> we're quite good at doing skull-based surgery and pervert, um, preventing morbidity and mortality with skull-based surgery. But it's not necessarily curative for patients with NF2. And some people have had, <clears throat> you know, uh, other tumors in other locations that need more surgeries. And there's just kind of a, a limit to uh, what patients can take. So we certainly need other, other possibilities. So here's a little more into the uh, data uh, looking at uh, uh, hearing results. So this is. Um, a study done of cochlear implantation with uh, people with NF2. So this is eight patients who had a, a CI. Some of their treatments had been uh, bevacizumab, uh, surgery, radiation treatments. They all had stable tumors. So they all had 0% AC bios on pre-op. So AC bios are a sentence. That means they had 0% speech discrimination, even under best stated conditions. And so the results were not as good as what we would uh, typically see for uh, patients with uh, um, hearing loss that isn't associated with tumor, but the average was at least 20% with a range up to 80%. But if you uh, 
you know, go from no hearing at all to uh, being able to hear 20% of words and sentences. That's a, a significant improvement. So um, <clears throat> although it is far from perfect, it certainly provides uh, a, a hearing, a hearing improvement. Uh, here's the picture of an auditory uh, uh, brainstem implant. And so similar to the cochlear implant, it, um, the business end here is a paddle that's going to rest on the uh, uh, cochlear nucleus itself, but otherwise uh, looks like a very similar device, even including um, <clears throat> the external type of headwear we associate with it. The ABI approved in America still has a older school magnet. So a lot of times this needs to be removed because someone with NF2 has any ongoing needs for uh, MRIs. So, Candidacy and the FDA approval in the United States is for patients who have bilateral seventh or eighth cranial nerve tumors. They have language competency. Uh, you have to be age 12, uh, psychologically suitable, um, and then willing to comply with research follow-up and have uh, good research, uh, realistic expectations of what the device can do for you. This is a... Uh, uh, image from the otologic surgery text showing the location of uh, uh, placement of the, the ABI paddle, which is going to go on the, uh, the cochlear nucleus, but it's right here, and you approach this through the uh, foramen of Lushka. So uh, that's it. Um, a little bit uh, shorter lecture but I didn't want to get into many of the details of the skull-based surgeries and everything because there's a lot of crossover there. So is there, I appreciate everybody's time. Any questions I can answer? All right. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, leave the meeting. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Oh, I have one question. Sorry. So with regards to testing, do I test the patient and family members? Um, <clears throat> Genetic testing. So th the answer is it depends. So if um, any anybody who you know has NF2 based on like uh, having bilateral vestibular schwannomas, the um, is not going to further further establish that diagnosis. However, uh, I do wind up testing most people because you can get prognostic information based on um, uh, the location of uh, the defect in Merlin. And so you can be able to advise someone that this is a more aggressive uh, uh, type. Um, family members, you know, I would, I would recommend testing of uh, all the children of a patient who had NF2. Uh, and I would do the genetic testing for all of those uh, kids who are asymptomatic. Everybody would start out with getting an audiogram uh, and then any abnormalities on the audiogram that you get an MRI. And you can do both at the same time, but the genetic testing, although it may be negative in a mosaic in a parent, if they have a germline mutation that's uh, gone on to the kids, it should show up. And then again, I personally don't usually do the genetic testing. My colleagues in uh, medical genetics are, are the ones who I, I refer patients and families. So um, I don't want to take a little in too much credit for uh, what it is I do with folks. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs>
So I'll go ahead and read the question for everybody just in case you're not seeing it automatically, but this is from Jeffrey Singh. Uh, we're classically taught acoustics grow one to two millimeters per year, and that is true. Regards to NF2 patients, general rule of thumb in terms of growth pattern, much more aggressive. Uh, again, the answer, unfortunately, is it depends. So the, on average, they still grow one to two millimeters per year. They some of them depending on uh, the genetics. So if you have like an early truncation uh, mutation, that it tends to be a lot more aggressive and uh, you can uh, pick that up from the genetic testing. So going back to Robert's question, um, that's part of the reason that I, that I test even people who are diagnosed. Um, but as a rule, they're not all much more aggressive. Uh, I have you know, I, I recently had a, a patient in her 70s who had two siblings who had NF2. She never had hearing loss. Uh, she had kind of predated genetic testing, and she was diagnosed in her 70s with two small tumors. Now, so that is unusual, uh, but I'm just using it to kind of point out that it, it is not always aggressive. There's a lot of variability with the disease. We see some very aggressive early disease and we see some stable disease where people have a normal lifespan and um, are deceased from other from other uh, health unrelated NF2 problems uh, at the end of a natural life. All right. Anything else we need to talk about? Thank you, everybody. Stay well, and I appreciate your time.